Hey, Em. How's it going, girl? Um, good morning. It is approximately 6.30 in the morning today, September 17th, 2018. And uh, I just want to... I'm curious about how you're doing today. Um, how's school been lately? How was your weekend? Um, it's a Monday today. I'm curious if you uh, had did any homework last weekend. <laughs> I did not do any homework. I wish I had. Um, but I was so busy. and uh, Or I made myself so busy and I just did not prioritize it. Right now, actually, I've got a lot of homework to do. And um, I'm really not quite sure how I'm going to get it all done by Wednesday, which is the day after tomorrow. So, you know, I wonder how is the homework load for you in your high school classes? Mm. Yeah. And I, uh, I wonder uh, how are things going for you in uh, in your classes? Uh, are there any subjects that you are enjoying particularly? Mm. Mm. Nice. You know, I'm enjoying uh, my metalworking class, and uh, that is my machining class, and I'm also enjoying my silversmithing class, and. Uh, I'm learning a lot in each one, having new experiences, and it's uh, it's pretty invigorating to continuously learn new things. Anyway, uh, let's move on to uh, the first uh, part of the day, and that is our reading of Peaceful Living from Mary McKenzie. Daily Meditations for Living with Love, Healing, and Compassion. And I'll read today's quote. Somebody's boring me. I think it's me. Dylan Thomas. You know, one thing that strikes me about that quote is this whole idea about how we are responsible for everything that we think. You know, there's a choice involved, and if we're feeling bored, it's because in some way, through direct action or indirect action, we're boring ourselves. We're allowing ourselves that, you know, and, and it may be that we've just been unconsciously conditioning ourselves to be bored. But it's, it's really, uh, you know, a fully voluntary type of um, activity, a mental act. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. The brain is so fascinating. It's, it's amazing to think that, you know, on the one hand, it appears that we're just dragged along by our brain, you know, dragged along for the ride. And then on the other hand, there is some degree of control that we have on our thoughts. And it's this balance, you know, do we want to be continually controlling what we're thinking? Or, or, or do we, um, are we, open to allowing the brain to function as it as it might normally function without our control you know it's it, is that even possible you know it's kind of interesting i i wish i really knew really how much control we had over our thinking process i think we've got a lot of control and i think quite often we don't take advantage of controlling the brain like we ought to maximize our peace and happiness and um, I know that sometimes I get carried away in a, like a, a line of obsessive thinking and um, and it's really it's really hard to pull away from that line and I might hold that line of thinking for hours and days and weeks and um, and now I'm able to distract myself about it sometimes, uh, this obsessive line of thinking. Let's say I, I'm driving a car or 
an emergency happens where a fire alarm goes off. But it's also something I return to after that event. So, you know, I think we as humans really struggle with this. You know, we, we, our brains are, are raucous and riotous. And, you know, our thoughts go every which way sometimes. And, uh, you know, I just really have an outpouring of feeling and compassion for every human being who struggles with their mind. You know, I think of the mind as, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's still developing. It's still in development. And, uh, you know, our environment is ever-changing, and you know, our minds are doing the best they can. Our mind, our, our bodies are in the 21st century, but our minds, I think, still might be uh, in the condition they were a millennia ago, or 10 millennia ago. And so, you know, our poor brain is trying to sort of catch up to all the culture <laughs> changes and environmental changes that are going on in our lives. And, um, you know, it really is a struggle. And, um, you know, I wish I had the answers about how to provide relief. Uh, though, you know, beyond things like cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy and motivational interviewing and nonviolent communication and, uh, you know, all these other practices and even dance uh, and uh, working out at the gym and just keeping yourself generally healthy. I don't have many other <laughs> helpful hints. That's about the gamut of hints. That's basically the spectrum of helpful behaviors to help one deal with the mind and body and, and deal with them effectively. And so, you know, it's really a continual search for better ways to manage one's mind. And uh, anyway, I'm here with you on that exploration, on that adventure. And, um, you know, we can, I, I think of us, us, us as partners on an adventure of the mind, you know, and how we can train it and get the best out of it that we can. Yeah. All right. So let's continue and uh, think a little bit about Mary McKenzie's uh, response to this quote. Creating your experience. That's the subtitle of Mary McKenzie's uh, contribution. She says, it is so easy to say, what a boring speaker, whenever we judge someone else, rather than acknowledge our own feelings. We miss the boat. Judging another person will not make our experience more interesting. In fact, it renders us powerless. Our best chance to shift from bored to intrigued is to focus on our unmet needs. Maybe we're tired and struggle to be interested in the topic, or maybe we don't understand its relevance to our lives. Once we connect to our unmet need, we can find ways to meet it. We could step outside and take a short nap to meet our need for rest, then be more able to stay present. Or perhaps we could ask the speaker how this topic relates to our life and how we can sustain our interest so that we can sustain our interest. Once we connect to our unmet need, we may even decide that it would be best for us to leave. Only after we connect to our unmet need can we make sound decisions that will transform our experience. And today's aphorism is, if you feel bored today, Connect to your unmet needs, and then look for strategies that will meet them. So, this relates to something that I've been noticing. You know, we have a lot of unmet needs, I think, in our lives. We're always trying to pursue, say, a need for success or significance or appreciation or a need for um, contentment uh, or simplicity. And, and often we are not aware of the needs. You know, we sort of, we develop strategies to improve our situation without really focusing on the needs that we're trying to meet. And in fact, uh, we, may, we may express our needs in ways that appear to be complaints. <laughs> you know, um, I happen not to complain very much. I just don't complain very much. 
And, but I know other people who complain a lot. And it's, it's interesting to watch them. You know, they might say, oh, the weather's too windy or something like that. But that statement in itself as a complaint is really a subtle expression of a need. And that is the need to have a windless day, the need to have a perfect day, or to a need to have a wind within uh, that blows uh, at, a, at a low speed. You know, that's what the wish is. That's, it's a wish about the weather. It's a need. That I, I have a need for a perfect day with wind blowing at a certain rate. You know, and it's kind of interesting how it comes off. You know, oh, it's too windy today. An option would be, uh, I would like to have more mo a more moderate wind blowing. You know, one is expressed as sort of a wish and a hope, and the other, um, you know, it's too windy today, is sort of expressed as a judgment, right? So, it's a, it's in, it's really interesting how judgments and wishes and, ho are, and hopes are mirror images of one another. So this is, a, I think, a transformative way of looking at judgment and complaints. Turn your judgments into needs. Turn them into wishes and hopes. And automatically the energy just shifts. You know, instead of saying, oh, that guy's angry. He's such an angry person. You know, that's a judgment. What you could say, say instead is turn it around and say, you know, I wish he was a little more sweet. I wish, I wish he was, uh, he said that in a more gentle way. And do you see how that, that's, that's really a transforming type of um, trick, a trick of language. You know, it's, every judgment is really expressing a need. And if you were to express a need, um, I think you'll come off as a lot more enjoyable to be around <laughs> instead of expressing judgments. <laughs> so anyway, keep that in mind. Um, one thing I like about Mary McKenzie's passage is this point here. She says, judging another person will not make our experience more interesting. In fact, it renders us powerless. So yeah, here's the thing about judgments, you know, quite often, Judgments are not very helpful. You know, you call someone a name or you identify something and then basically you're stuck. Um, that's as far as you can go. You make a judgment, that's as far as you can go. Maybe if it's a moral judgment, that is, a, that is about the extent of your power. <laughs> it's just to express the moral judgment. And then, you know, you, in a way you sort of hope for someone external to solve the problem for you to, uh, to, uh, but you know, it doesn't get you very far. It's real, it's far better to describe your world in terms of needs. And if you do, what you can do once you've identified the need is you can take steps. You know, it's like having, deciding on a goal and then, uh, pointing yourself in the direction to achieve that goal step by step by step. So anyway, anyway, that's just a t little helpful hint to help you uh, be effective in the world. And uh, oh, in fact, it's reiterated here in Mary McKenzie's uh, paragraph. She says, once we connect to our unmet need, we can find ways to meet it. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. But we have to connect to that need first. We have to make ourselves aware of it. Anyway, all right, that's enough of that. And uh, I think it's time to read a passage from the book, My Zombie, My Big Fat Zombie Goldfish. <laughs> Check out that zombie goldfish. Now, we're on chapter four now. And uh, if you recall, um, Tom, who's the protagonist and the narrator in the story, his brother Mark 
put some pollution into a fishbowl and the poor fish uh, began to struggle and Tom uh, pulled the fish out of the polluted water and um, brought over his friend Pradeep, uh, his next door neighbor, by talking to him on his walkie talkie. And uh, Pradeep came over and they did, I guess, like CPR. They gave the they gave the fish shock therapy with a nine volt battery, and they brought the ba they brought the fish back to life. And and then uh, they put the the fish back into its bowl, and uh, the end of the chapter was when uh, Tom looked into the bowl, and the goldfish looked back and gave Tom a wink. <laughs> so. Let's, the, the fish came back to life from the dead. So here we are, chapter four, Frankenfish. All right, did you see that? I turned to Pradeep. What? Pradeep was drying his hands on the bathroom towel. The way Frankie looked at me, he winked. I stared down at the goldfish, but now he was looking around in the normal way the goldfish do. You know, where do one of their, you know, where one, of their eyes is looking at the wall and the other eye is looking up your left nostril at the same time. Never mind, I said, shaking my head. We've got to get Frankie back in his bowl before Mark notices his, he's gone or else. You're dead meat, Pradeep finished my words. We ran back into Mark's room to grab the bowl of gloopy green water. You can't put him back in the bowl. The gunji will kill him, or the gung will kill him, Pradeep said. We can't put him in clean water. Mark will notice and kill me. And then he'll kill Frankie. We ran back to the bathroom, sat on the radiator, and stared at Frankie swimming around in the sink. Then I had an idea. Hey, what if we made it green with safe stuff? Remember that green food coloring stuff your mom used last St. Patrick's Day. I mean, if it's okay for people to eat, it's gotta be okay for, for fish to swim in, right? Pradeep thought a sec. It'll have to be. Pradeep's mom isn't Irish. She just gets really into holidays. You can pretty much name a holiday and Pradeep's mom has had a party for it. When we think, when we went over there for her St. Patrick's Day party, she had dyed everything green. We even had green finger sandwiches, which it turns out don't even have real fingers in them. Total false advertising. And she had green milkshakes and green cupcakes with green icing. It was cool, except that when you eat 17 green cupcakes in a row, it means you throw up in green. <laughs> we have to get some of the green food coloring from your kitchen, I said. I can't go home, Pradeep said. My mom will make me stay for the Earth Day polar bear pajama party that she's having. I looked at Pradeep with a face that said, I can't even ask why she would do that. He answered my face. She says the North Pole has really long nights and the polar bears sleep a lot. So they'd want a pajama party, he paused. I told her it didn't work. Never mind. Okay, I'll go and get the food coloring, I said. As I started for the stairs, I could hear the thump, thump, thump of Mark's music coming through his headphones. He must be on the couch just by the steps. There was no way I could sneak past. Okay, I'm taking escape route number five. Pradeep and I had planned 16 different escape routes, escape routes from both our houses just in case of a code red. Route five was out of my bathroom window. Pradeep it's up to you to get to stop Mark from coming upstairs before I get back. You can count on me, Pradeep said. I'll think of something to keep him occupied. He gave me a thumbs up and then took a deep breath and headed downstairs to the TV room where Mark was slumped over the couch. Can I say that's a really cool white scientist coat you're wearing, Pradeep said. I heard him start to tell Mark about the nature special on the National Geographic channel that shows you what's really in a crocodile's stomach. Time for escape route five. I opened the window of the bathroom and stood on the toilet lid to climb out onto the garage roof. 
Suddenly, it looked a lot farther down to the roof than it did in the drawing we'd done in Pradeep's notebook. No going back, though. I edged out the window. Then I heard a splash and a thwap. Before I even turned around, I knew what that sound was. It was the sound of a wet goldfish hitting a tiled floor. Oh no. I think the fish has left the sink and fallen onto the floor. All right. Boy, that zombie goldfish gets around. All right. Fantastic. So, let's move on to uh, this DK Eyewitness Books uh, book about explorers. Now, if you recall, last few days we've been discussing the conquistadors and how as explorers out of Spain, they discovered uh, North America. That is for Western civilization. The e Eastern civilization had already uh, settled in North America. The Native American Indians, uh, uh, about 20,000 years ago, uh, walked across the uh, land bridge between Asia and Alaska. And they, do, they did it during the height of the Ice Age. And they uh, left Asia, walked across the land bridge, and then settled in uh, places down in the North American continent. And uh, down in North America, and uh, down in, through Mexico, what exists is modern day Mexico, and through Central America, and even down to South America. And, uh, and then um, Christopher Columbus, along with others, uh, left Spain and they traveled to Veracruz, Mexico, and, um, and then they began to battle uh, uh, with the Aztecs and the Inca in Peru, uh, looking for gold and converting them to Christianity. <laughs> so yesterday I talked a little bit about how I wanted to address Catholicism. I talked a little bit about Catholicism and how, at least right now, it's the dominant religion in, in uh, Mexico and South America. And, um, and it has these explorers to thank. <laughs> um, so, uh, in this book, there's a passage that I wanted to read called The Gospel. And it addresses a little bit of um, what was happening here related to religion. And... Um, and sort of the Spaniards and their relationship to the Native Americans. So, the Gospel. The Catholic religion was of vital importance to the Spanish conquistadors. All Spanish expeditions were accompanied by a priest who was expected or who was expected both to conduct religious services and to convert to Christianity. Any heathens, in quotes, they encountered. Both priests and soldiers were disgusted by the religions they came across in the New World. Human sacrifice was common, as was the worship of idols. The Spanish set about systematically destroying temples and executing local priests, which led to the total disruption of the Aztec and Incan societies. The policy was so widespread and complete that today, the principal religion in Central and South America is Catholicism. So I was talking about judgment earlier. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. When it comes to cultures and values, uh, there's a relativity. Um, there's a relativity, a cultural relativity that exists. You might have a certain set of viewpoints and practices, and another person from another culture might have a, a related but a different set. You know, their origins, they have separate origins. Uh, these behaviors have separate origins. They're based on separate belief systems. And so um, quite often when two people meet, there is a um, <coughs> There is a sort of a, there are differences uh, between the two viewpoints and and beliefs and behavior, and um, 
you know, there are different approaches to solve the same problem. The problem of survival, the problem of civilization, there are different approaches. And um, when you look at one approach through a different set of values, it can seem, um, well, it seems that it's not optimal. <laughs> I'm so charitable. It seems that it's not optimal. And you know, there was a, I, I, I kind of wonder what the Native Americans thought about the, uh, the, the colonists. And you know, I could imagine that they, that the Native Americans thought the colonists were heathens. Um, certainly based on their violent behavior. <laughs> uh, and you know their willingness to impose their own authority uh, over the Native Americans that lived in uh, Central and South America. It, it's it's really interesting. Um, yeah. So, human sacrifice was common. That's actually pretty interesting. In fact, you know, uh, one of the more stereotypical ideas that uh, I've learned is this idea of, say, Aztecs and the uh, human sacrifice. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't have a lot to say about that. Um, you know, death plays a significant role in every culture. You know, it has its own meaning in each culture and people have different ways of dying uh, and um, you know <clears throat> I've heard of something here that's developing in the United States called dead death midwifery so I don't know if you're familiar with a midwife but a midwife is a person who helps a pregnant woman give birth to a child. She helps that person, or he helps that, that midwife, helps that person in uh, that period of transition. And it, that's a period of transition that involves the birth of a life. Now there are thing, people who are death midwives, and they, again, help a person through the transition from being alive to being dead. And... Um, you know, there are a lot of feelings that come up around death for people. And quite often that feeling is fear. You know, people are afraid of dying. And uh, how wonderful would, would it be to have a counselor by your side while you're going through the dying process? And I'm really a fan of this idea of dead mid midwifery. And uh, and it, it's very appropriate that, that there ought to be midwives helping people through transitions uh, through both those stages of life, through birth and death, and we we also we also have living midwiferies. Uh, they're called counselors or psychotherapists. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We really do. We really benefit as human beings in our experience. We benefit from the help of others. We benefit from their advice as we're moving, as we're transitioning from one period of our life to another. And, uh, you know, we rely, we need other people. We really do need other people for these transitions, for these transformations. You know, quite often we need their perspective. Uh, people who are maybe are not as emotionally involved in what we're going through. People who can offer advice and perspective. Really, perspective is everything. And, you know, it, you know, you can go through any kind of experience with the right perspective. You know, a person's perspective is, uh, you know, it just, uh, it can be helpful or hurtful. <laughs> it can make an experience uh, happy or sad. Uh, you know, a perspective is so important. And you know, a perspective and attitude, perspective and attitude work together. And, um, you know, they're related to one another. And, 
you know, living your best self is about. All right, and here we go. We're going to continue reading uh, of the, from this book called Explorers. And there's a, a picture here. It looks like there are some cute conquistadors walking alongside Native American Indians. And uh, there is a, um, a little passage beneath it. I'll read it, a caption. The Last Conquistador. In 1540, rumors of a rich city far to the north led to a large expedition headed by Francisco Coronado. He marched through much of what is now the United States, reaching the Kansas River and discovering the Grand Canyon. However, Coronado found neither gold nor a city. <laughs> um, and then uh, here's another picture. It looks like it has uh, uh, a leader of, say, a some kind of Native American group, maybe an Aztec group, and he's holding a person's heart. And the caption is, Cruel Religion. The Aztec religion seemed very cruel to, uh, to the conquistadors. Several Aztec gods demanded blood sacrifices. Humans sacrificed to the war god uh, Huitzipochtitl, uh, had their still beating hearts cut out with a knife. Whoa. So, um, Francisco Coronado, there is a shopping mall in Albuquerque named after Francisco Coronado. It's called Coronado Shopping Mall. <laughs> and in fact, um, in the, uh, I guess the Albuquerque Museum of Art, there is a, a lot of art they're related to Coronado. A lot of um, of saddles and armor and spears and swords that were recovered that have been recovered as historical artifacts in the museum. And uh, it's maybe one of these days we can find time to go visit. And it's really fascinating. And it's basically one of the best art museums that I've seen in terms of treatments of the conquistadors. And um, it really is amazing. Uh, and I, I did not know this. I did not know that Francisco Coronado discovered the Grand Canyon. That's amazing. You know, they really did a lot of traveling back then. I mean, can you imagine uh, traveling from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to the Grand Canyon in Arizona, which is far away? And then, and then traveling back and then going to the Kansas, walking to Kansas. These people walked all over the place. I'm really impressed, always impressed by these stories of ancient peoples doing so much walking. You know, they, it seems like they were always camping and moving and migrating and exploring new areas. They were just restless. You know, they were always traveling somewhere. I really find it fascinating. I really admire that too. You know, for me, if I can walk three miles in a day <laughs> or, or even five miles a day, that is a big deal. Uh, you know, we're, today in our society, we're just so stationary. So we just don't walk around very much. But these folks, they walk, that was their whole job. I mean, as explorers, they travel. And, um, it's pretty interesting. So anyway, that's that. So I wanted to mention just uh, how much I've been enjoying using my camera. Yesterday, I went over to a friend's house, uh, Reese is his name, and in Santa Barbara near Isla Vista. And um, we had a nice little pool party there. He's got a beautiful home and it's got a swimming pool and a hot tub. And with a handful of friends, we were hanging out. We had dinner potluck style. And uh, we went swimming together in the swimming pool and then hung out in the hot tub. And we talked about Burning Man, the Burning Man Music and Art Festival. And um, I just had a really good time relating with people and talking with them and learning about their lives. There's a friend of uh, mine that's going to be traveling to Thailand and we got to talk about the potential of that experience and how transformative it, it will be for her as she uh, basically moves uh, from the United States to Thailand. And, you know, 
it was really enjoyable. You know, I always like my time that I spend with other people. And um, more to the point, I got to use my camera. Uh, I took some photographs of them, uh, basically of us together in a group, and I might share those photographs with you. And, uh, and then afterwards, after the party, I went and walked around uh, Isla Vista a little bit. I went to the Isla Vista uh, food co-op and visited there, picked up a drink, and I walked around Isla Vista, which is an amazing place. It's neat to see all those college kids. You know, it's, it's really impressive to see how they get around on their skateboards and bicycles. I was watching people uh, on skateboards uh, 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 sort of push themselves on skateboards and carry water bottles. I saw a person, more than, a, more than just one person, I saw a couple people riding their bicycles while holding surfboards. It looked pretty awesome. You know, uh, when you go to college, not if, but when, <laughs> uh, you know, I think UC Santa Barbara might be a, a really good choice. Uh, and maybe even uh, UC uh, Cal Poly, University of Calipar California, I guess maybe Cal California State University, Cal Poly. I'm not sure exactly what its name is. In San Luis Obispo. Those are pretty awesome looking colleges. And uh, that would be uh, neat for you to attend either one of those, partly because you're, you would be so close and that would make it easier for me to, um, to hang out with you. Uh, but anyway, I took some photographs. I was, it's called street photography. And uh, I really enjoyed walking around um, the area, taking photographs of people and building facades and uh, plants and the sky which I you know for some reason I really enjoy taking pictures of the sky of the stars taking pictures of the stars and the moon and the clouds and the sun and the sunsets I mean it's just so beautiful you know I love photography because well, I love the pictures that it creates, and I love also just kind of walking around and exploring areas and uh, looking at things, looking at new things and preserving them on camera and on digital film. I don't know. I really got a kick out of it. It was really pleasant and pleasurable. And, you know, if you have an interest in photography, I'd be happy to take some time out so that, uh, you know, we can share that interest. I remember that we used to exchange photographs um, with certain themes at one time. Uh, one of the themes was at one time um, taking pictures of anything with, that has the color red. And I think there was another one, anything with the color green. And, um, and then there was another one, any kind of funny sign. And um, I like those photography challenges and I think I want to start that up again. I think I want to start sending you photographs of um, where we left off, that is um, photographs of things that are colored red. <laughs> so maybe that's what I'll try to do. I think that's what I'm going to try to do. Maybe I'll try to send you a picture this week of something with the color red in it. Well. Uh, Emily, I just want to say how much I enjoyed spending time with you today and um, thank you for spending some time with me and um, you know I look forward to the times we get to spend uh, we get to share together in the future and uh, I hope you're doing well and uh, I'm curious about what's on your mind and what interests you have in the moment. Um, one thing that is very interested and I'm interesting and I'm looking forward to is that SpaceX launch that we're going to look at on what is it the 7th of October. I'm looking forward to that. I think that'll be a lot of fun. We'll get to watch the SALCOM spacecraft launch and we'll also get to watch the first stage booster land. Hopefully. I've got my fingers crossed. Hopefully that works out. And, um, and we can make that happen and we can hear the sonic booms and have that, that interesting experience together. And I think rather historic experience. So anyway, I love you, girl. 
and I wish you the best. I hope that you continue to be healthy and happy. Peace.